Hi, I'm Andrea. Welcome to today's Harper Lecture. The Harper Lecture series highlights the University of Chicago's collective commitment to the highest aspirations and standards in research and education. Today, you will hear from our world-class faculty and enjoy stimulating conversations on critical topics, all in the comfort of your home. We extend our appreciation in advance to our global university community for their collective efforts in supporting the mission of the university in today's deeply challenging environment. Technology has allowed us to remain connected and engaged, and tonight, you too will be part of the conversations. A couple of notes. All participants will be muted. However, we do encourage you to ask questions. We will have plenty of time for questions at the end of the presentation. If you have issues with audio, you may want to shut down your programs running in the background or dial in from your phone. Hi, I'm Colin. On behalf of everyone at the UChicago Alumni Office, we offer our deepest gratitude and appreciation for your continued support. We're proud to be part of this community as it has come together during these trying times to invest in our students, empower our faculty and scientists, and extend care and connection. And now it's my pleasure to welcome you to the 41st season of the University of Chicago's Harper Lecture Series. Thank you for being with us. Enjoy. Hi, everyone. Welcome to today's Harper Lecture, How You Say It, How Speech Structures Our Lives and Our World, featuring Katherine Kinsler. I'm Andrea Hodgman, Associate Director, Director for Intellectual Engagement and Travel for Alumni Relations and Development, and I'm the Program Manager for the Harper Lecture Series. I'm so pleased to see how many of you have joined us since we've gone virtual. On behalf of everyone at the UChicago Alumni Office, thank you for joining us. It is my pleasure to introduce our faculty guest today. Our Q&A moderator is Professor Nick Epley. Professor Epley is the John Templeton Keller Professor of Behavioral Science and the Director of the Center for Decision Research at the University of Chicago Booth School of Business. He studies social cognition, how thinking people think about other thinking people. He teaches an ethics and happiness course to MBA students called Designing a Good Life. Professor Epley was actually a Harper Lecture speaker this past spring, and we're so delighted to welcome him back to the circuit. Thank you for being here, Professor Epley. Now, please allow me to introduce Katherine Kinsler. Professor Kinsler is a professor of psychology at the University of Chicago. Her research sits at the intersection of developmental and social psychology. Her work focuses on the origins of prejudice and in-group, out-group thinking, with an emphasis on understanding how language and accent marks social groups. She's also interested in food cognition and moral psychology. Professor Kinsler joined our faculty in 2008 as a Neubauer Family Assistant Professor. She then spent 2015 to 2019 at Cornell University, where she was most recently the chair of the psychology department. We are really happy to have her back at UChicago. I actually recently read Professor Kinsler's book, and it is really engaging, as you can probably see from all of my notes here. <laughs> so if you are interested in linguistics, equity, or psychology, this is a wonderful read and it is the book for you. Professor Kinsler, thank you for joining us. The virtual floor is yours. Thank you so much, Andrea, for having me. Um, and thanks so much, Nick, for joining us in conversation. I'm so glad to be here and to speak with you about language and social life. Um, it would be wonderful to do so in person, but I'm so glad to have the chance to be here virtually. Um, I'm going to talk to you uh, about my research in psychology on language. Um, my book is called How You Say It, as is the title of my talk tonight. It's about how speech structures our lives and our world. I thought I'd start with a story. Um, this is a story from 100 years ago, from 1920, of a teacher who was convicted of a crime. And what the teacher had done was he had taught a student, a 10 year old child to read biblical verses in German. And the reason this was a crime was because of a 1919 law in the state of Nebraska. It read as follows. Languages other than the English language may be taught as languages only after pupils shall have attained and successfully passed the eighth grade. Now this law was passed in the shadow of World War I when there was a lot of xenophobia um, around. 
Now, the conviction was upheld by the Nebraska Supreme Court. Here is an excerpt from their decision. To all the children of foreigners who had emigrated here, to be taught from early childhood the language of the country of their parents was to rear them with that language as their mother tongue. It was to educate them so they must always think in that language and, as a consequence, naturally inculcate in them the ideas and sentiments foreign to the best interests of this country. So I added emphasis to that last part so you can see that one problem, of course, in the eyes of the Nebraskan legislators was that by teaching a child a language prior to the eighth grade, they would, of course, learn that language since children are really good at learning languages. But also the fear was that by learning a language other than English, this might somehow change their way of thinking such that they might think something that was somehow less American by nature of not being presented in English. This law was overturned by the US Supreme Court, as were several other laws in neighboring states around the same time. And the US Supreme Court said, it is well known that proficiency in a foreign language seldom comes to one not instructed at an early age. And experience shows that this is not injurious to the health, morals, or understanding of the ordinary child. Now, of course, just because uh, the Supreme Court uh, rules one way doesn't mean that everybody always necessarily agrees. Um, I'm going to play now. This is a more recent uh, bit of trivia. So this is from 2014, a Super Bowl ad. You may recognize it. Oh, beautiful for spacious skies. Now, Time Magazine had this, uh, this story, Coca-Cola's It's Beautiful Super Bowl ad brings out some ugly Americans in response to a lot of xenophobic commentary on Twitter and other social media platforms. More recently, Pew Research Poll polled a bunch of Americans and asked them, would it bother you to hear a language other than English spoken in a public place? And 29% of Americans say, yes, it would. Now, this history of language as being this really critical part of our social groups, our social identities, our national identities, this is something that is very ancient and longstanding. And in many ways, language and speaking the same way as somebody can bring us together and cultivate bonds and be an incredible feature of a culture and an identity. At the same time, when somebody speaks in a way that is different from you, it's often really easy to detect. And so just as we figure out like me from English, we also figure out not like me. And in fact, given that we're so good at learning languages as children, and often much less good as adults, when somebody speaks, they're telling you something about the voices that they heard as a child. And from that, people can sometimes pick out a difference or somebody who is not a native speaker of my language. So here's a bit of Old Testament trivia. This is from the biblical story of Shibboleth. The Gileadites captured the fords of the Jordan, and whenever a survivor of Ephraim said, let me go over, the men of Gilead asked him, are you an Ephraimite? If he replied, no, they said, all right, say Shibboleth. If he said Sibboleth because he could not pronounce the word correctly, they seized him and killed him at the fords of the Jordan. 42,000 Ephraimites were killed at that time. Now that's a particularly bloody example, but if we look out in the world today or any day, it's no surprise to anybody that humans form social groups or tribes, often preferring individuals who are seen as members of in-groups to other people who are seen as members of an out-group, and this can have uh, really negative consequences for how we treat each other. So in psychology, now I'm trained as a psychologist, um, and in psychology, there's a lot of evidence about how groups form. And, you know, kind of the take home is that we divide ourselves into groups really based on anything. It could be something relatively trivial and me meaningless in one context. And then all of a sudden, this minute that it has group meaning, it starts to matter. And people start to like people who share that group identity. 
That said, often psychologists converge on identifying what you might think of as three big or prominent categories, which are gender, race, and age. Um, and the general idea here is that it's really easy for us to categorize people based on this, these variables, and it's really hard to suppress categorization. So a classic example in a psychology class would be something like you move into a new apartment building, you're carrying a bunch of boxes, you're really frazzled and you meet your neighbor. And you realize afterwards, oh no, I couldn't pick her out of a lineup. Um, but I do remember that she's a middle-aged white woman. And so you see how you can remember something about somebody's social category information that's not really about them as an individual. Um, now, what I'll note is that despite everything I just said about language and despite the importance of language for our lives, with a few notable exceptions, studies of language as a social category are often underrepresented in research by social and experimental psychologists who study prejudice and intergroup relationships. Yet language is really critical for how we form human groups, for our feelings of identity, for who we connect with, and for who we see as being not in our group. Um, and luckily, there's a number of other disciplines who have studied this. And so in a lot of my work, although I'm a psychologist, I draw really heavily on neighboring disciplines in the social and behavioral sciences, um, finding that all over the globe, language divides groups. As groups change, language is changed to follow suit. And there are a number of studies um, dating back to the 1960s that I found really informative in my work, which are studies of accent attitudes. And so I'll give you an example. A lot of this research occurred in Canada and Montreal specifically in a time at which there was a lot of political turmoil um, and language politics. Uh, so you might ask French speaking Canadians and English speaking Canadians what they thought about two different groups of speakers. And they might explicitly tell you, oh, we're you know, very egalitarian here, everybody's, uh, everybody's Canadian. Um, and yet when you ask people to evaluate others based on how they sound, so you'd hear a voice clip of somebody speaking in English or speaking in French. Now often it could actually be the same bilingual person speaking in both languages. And then a listener might say something like, oh, that first person sounded just a lot, that English speaker happened to sound a lot nicer and smarter and even taller. Um, and what you can see there is something that's really not a judgment about an individual. It's a judgment about a social group and it's stereotypes and prejudices that people might have about a group that they could then apply to an individual based on their speech. And so today what I'd like to do is to make the case for language as a social category that structures our social interactions, our lives, how we judge others. Um, this begins in childhood and that's what I'm gonna spend much of the talk on today. My research which sits at, sits at the intersection of developmental and social psychology really seeks to understand where our social thinking comes from. How and when do we divide the world into groups often preferring our own groups? How might this give rise to later prejudices. And so I think understanding where we came from and how our environments shape that is really critical for understanding where we end up as adults. Now, the way you speak, and I'll argue judge others for speaking, impacts people's interpersonal interactions, their trust in others, their learning, their employment and earnings, and uh, justice in the law when we think about broader societal and structural problems. Yet, we don't always think about the social meaning of language. Now, I use we in a really broad sense here, so I could mean it as, psycho as social psychologists who are studying social groups, but I think it's a lot broader than this. I think it's we as as parents, as educators, as policymakers, as citizens, as neighbors, and so forth, I think we're often somewhat blind, we're somewhat unaware of how much um, language matters for our interactions with each other. And I hope that that's something that people are able to then reflect on. So one thing that I find particularly fascinating about the intersection of language in our social lives is that language both changes and it stays the same. So in many ways, the way we speak across our lifespans can change. If you enter a new social community, you have a new social identity, new social ambitions, all of this can be reflected in um, the people that you, in the way that your voice sounds to others. And it can change that when two people come together and they like each other, often their voices sound a little bit more alike. 
So um, linguists have studied people's uh, voices across time, um, and I'm going to give a particularly um, important example. Uh, this is linguists who have studied Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg's voice across her lifespan and found something really interesting. Now, Justice Ginsburg grew up in Brooklyn, and what researchers did were they were interested in how she sounded when she was a lawyer arguing in front of the Supreme Court in the 70s, and how she sounded when she was a Supreme Court justice uh, later on. Um, so from after 1993, um, and the clip I'm gonna show you is from uh, 2010. And so let me first play uh, what she sounded like in the 70s for you to hear. Stephen Weisenfeld's case concerns the entitlement of a female wage earner, a female wage earner's family, to social insurance of the same quality as that accorded the family of a male wage earner. Now, what you might note there is that you really don't hear a lot of a Brooklyn or a New York accent coming through. Um, let me play what she sounded like in 2010. I think your point was that Duran was quite different in the numbers. Yeah, it was women, 54% of the population, and then dwindled to 14.5%. Uh, of the jurors, available jurors. Now, in her earlier years, when she was lawyer Ginsburg, um, the linguists argue that she, like many other people, felt that she had a lot to prove. She'd faced tremendous instances of sexism and other prejudices. And like what many people do is when you feel like you're being evaluated by somebody, you try to speak in a way that you think might sound the most standard to them or the most proper in some way. Sociolinguists call this linguistic insecurity where you really try to change your voice to match um, what you think the ideal might be. Whereas in the later years, um, she was a Supreme Court justice. She had nothing left to prove, and you can hear the voice of her youth coming through. And so in many ways, I think the story is really inspiring um, about her voice and herself um, and her past. At the same time, it also says something about a society that can place expectations on the way that we're supposed to sound. Now, our language changes and it can reflect our new aspirations or our beliefs about what other people want us to sound like. At the same time, much of our language is set early on. Um, newborn infants right away start to prefer the sound of a language they've heard before, even before they were born, the sound of their mother speaking to a foreign language. And brand new babies can even discriminate between two foreign languages, provided that those two foreign languages are sufficiently different. So right away from birth, we're starting to detect what's a familiar language and what might be a different language. Um, and there's a critical period in language acquisition that's been really well studied, showing that many of our linguistic settings are set early in life, that it's just much easier to learn a language as a child. It doesn't mean, of course, that it's impossible as an adult, but it's tremendously difficult as an adult to learn a language to a native-like proficiency. Now, in some of my early research, I was interested in how this social thinking about language really gets off the ground. How do we start to think about people and the intersection of the way they speak and who they are? How do we start to you know, express these in-group preferences based on somebody who speaks in a familiar accent of a familiar language? And so in one study I conducted with babies, um, these are 10-month-old babies who were living in monolingual English-speaking homes in the US and monolingual English monolingual French speaking homes in France. And we were interested in a really simple pref a really simple question, which was those early auditory preferences for familiar sounding language. Does that generalize to something that seems more like a social preference for a person who spoke to you in a native language? So I'm gonna show you the video that the baby saw. So you're taking the perspective of an infant right now. Hey baby, how are you today? I'm so glad you came to play with me since I love telling stories and playing games. Coucou bébé, regarde-moi, comment ça va? Je suis trop contente que tu sois venue me voir, comme j'adore raconter tes histoires et jouer à des jeux. 
Okay, so it turns out it's not that hard to trick a baby. And so what you saw there were some toys that kind of looked like they emerged from the screen. Um, of course, they didn't actually, they came from behind the table. Um, and we just measured where babies reached. Now it was the same toy. And I'll also note for you that the toys were never actually paired on screen uh, while the people were speaking. So one person spoke in English and one person spoke in French. Now, importantly for the babies, um, half of the babies were babies familiar with English and half of them were babies familiar with French. So that way we'd know it wasn't just that one person was more attractive or appealing to babies in some way. Um, we also across babies counterbalance which person appeared on the left and which person appeared on the right, which person spoke first to try to get rid of any other extraneous variables that might guide a baby's attention. Um, and I'll show you, this is a little schematic of a baby participating. That baby would be reaching for the toy on the right. Um, and here's what we found, that babies in France reached more for uh, toys offered by the French speaker and babies in the US and English speaking homes um, reached more for toys offered by uh, the English speaker. And so what you see here is this early preference that feels like it's some sort of a, uh, an approach or an interesting and in engaging with somebody who spoke to the baby in a language that was familiar to them. Now, as kids uh, get older, um, they continue to orient to native speakers and it starts to show itself in several different ways. Um, so slightly older babies eat foods that were first modeled by native speakers. So there can be this really subtle cultural learning that's happening that as a parent, you might not notice as you watch your kid eat stuff, that they're actually learning something that uh, might not be apparent just by watching them. Um, babies also start to see social categories. So using other methods, using methods of babies looking time to be able to detect when they detect novelty or something that's surprising or different, we find that babies start to group people together, thinking that two people who speak a common language are alike in some other meaningful way and are more likely to engage in a positive way as compared to two people who speak in different languages. And as they get older, kids continue to express preferences based on people who speak in a familiar language or a familiar accent of that language. Sometimes these preferences based on accent can matter more than kids' preferences based on race, which start to emerge in early childhood. Um, nonetheless, children sometimes can show preferences that are even stronger based on somebody's accent. Children start to learn about linguistic status too. So in the studies I just talked about, these were kids who were just hearing English versus just hearing French, but you can find actually most children in the world, a majority of children are raised hearing more than one language. Um, a monolingual English speaking children are really the, the unusual ones there. And so for instance, my collaborators and I did some studies in South Africa where we saw that kids who were exposed to say five or six languages would get familiar with all of them and would also start to pick pick up on societal, uh, societal structures about what kinds of people and what languages were seen as being higher status or seen as being associated with greater amounts of wealth. And so kids are cultural sponges and picking up on, societal's atti on society's attitudes. And so often that includes learning about uh, what society sees as valued. Uh, our thinking about language also matters for who uh, we trust. Now, trust is a really fundamental part of human social interactions in so many different domains. Um, and in some of my studies, I found that children trust information provided by native accented speakers. So what I've just said probably doesn't sound very surprising, particularly if you're thinking, well, perhaps, um, perhaps information that was presented in a native accent was just a little bit easier to understand understand and probably things that are easier to understand are liked more. And there is absolutely some truth to that. People call this something like a processing fluency account where things that are easy and fluid to process are going to be preferred a bit. Yet we tried really hard in this study to see whether there were trust aspects of language sort of above and beyond people's ability to comprehend. And it seems that there were. So for instance, we would have one person speak in a native accent in English and one person speak in a foreign accent in English and children who spoke English will then see them demonstrate two different ways silently to use an object that they didn't know how to use. And what they do with they, was that they thought that the person who spoke in the native accent was more likely to have demonstrated the correct way to use the object. 
Next, what we did with a different group of kids was we had the two people speak in complete nonsense speech. So nobody conveyed any meaningful information at all to the child. And yet, again, they thought that the person who spoke in nonsense speech with a native accent was more likely uh, to be correct about something even when it was an entirely nonverbal thing that they were teaching. And there's evidence that this tendency continues into adulthood. Um, my colleague um, in the psychology department here, Boaz Kazar, and his um, and his colleagues have found that adults find native accented statements to be more accurate. And more generally, there's other studies showing that people's credibility can be really impacted, or people's judgments of others' credibility can be really impacted by the way that people speak. Um, this can happen in a really low-level way, which is what some of Boaz's studies find. Um, and so in these studies, you know, imagine learning a fact, something that you don't, doesn't really matter and you don't know what it is. So say for instance, how long does a bear sleep for? Well, you don't know, but if you hear a guess of an answer and if it's said in a native accent, people are more likely to believe it as being likely to be true. In some of my other studies, I've looked at children's inferences about identity over time. And so do they think that language is a property that's really sticky and predictive of your future self that the way you speak now might predict how you're going to sound in the future? Um, let me show you an example of what children saw. Um, so you're going to see a child and then two adults. And the question is, which adult will this child grow up to be? Sometimes there is a seesaw at the park. Sledding is a sport that is played in the snow. Quand il fait froid, on peut faire de la luge. So as savvy adults, you probably noted that neither um, adult was, you know, that there was some complexity to this task. And so one adult matched the child's language, but not her race, and the other one matched her race, but not her language. Now I'll tell you, if I play children this task with either holding language contact, constant and manipulating race or holding race constant and manipulating language, kids are at ceiling on this task. They're really good at it. So they can absolutely tra track both variables. So the question is what happens happens when the variables, variables are put in conflict. Um, so I'll show you uh, what we found. Um, so uh, the first group of kids we tested were white children living in Chicago. They were in fourth grade. Um, and uh, they thought that the race that the race match was the likely person that this child would grow up to be. They could say things like, you know, people kind of look the same when they grow up, or you know, kids kind of look like they'll be when they're an adult. Um, and maybe they moved, or maybe they learned a new language, or maybe um, they're bilingual. And so next we tested a group of white uh, five and six year old kindergarten age children in Chicago. And here kids picked the language match. Um, and so, you know, we found this somewhat surprising that they thought that somebody was, you know, going to keep their language across the lifespan, even if that meant uh, looking different, even if that meant uh, looking very different as they got older. We were wondering if part of our result could be because Chicago and Hyde Park in particular is such a diverse environment. Um, we tested a group of kids who were in a much more homogeneous environment in terms of both racial diversity and linguistic diversity. Um, and we found that a group of kids in northern Wisconsin, a group of white children also chose the race match over the, oh, sorry, also chose the language match over the race match. And then finally, we tested a group of African American children in Chicago. Now these were five and six year old kids in the same neighborhood and the same classroom as the white kids. Um, and what we found here were that these young African American children um, looked much more, their responses patterned much more with the older white children as opposed to the younger white children. And so this suggests that early social categorization is going to be somewhat flexible and dependent on your early social environment. There's a lot of of evidence to suggest that um, white kids don't know as much of, about race as do um, African American children or uh, children from children from other minority groups in the US. And so I think it's really important as we learn more about how social categorization unfolds to think about early diversity in the environments kids are in and the experiences that they're having. Now, I wanna talk a little bit about how social biases 
develop. Um, so, you know, I started with thinking about uh, linguistic prejudice, really how people can be biased against foreigners um, or against people who speak in a way that's seen as not standard or not like the way they speak. Um, what I've shown you so far for kids, I would say, is about an early preference for native. It's about carving up the world in terms of language, but the kids, the data that I've shown so far, I wouldn't say is similar to the kinds of um, biased or prejudiced attitudes that adults would show, but kids start to learn those attitudes. Um, and kids are living in a world where they're picking up on attitudes that are expressed by adults. And again, they're absolutely learning them. Um, and so I'm gonna show you a study looking at how kids start to think about different dialect differences in the US. Um, so here are uh, two people, and I'm gonna show you now one of, them, one of them had a voice that was recorded in Illinois, and then the other one in Tennessee. Here's the first one. In general, dogs are bigger than cats. And here's the second one. In general, dogs are bigger than cats. And we tested this with a group of kids in Illinois and in Tennessee. Um, and I'll show you what we found. So when we tested a group of five and six-year-old kids, um, they didn't really know much about the two different speakers. You know, the kids in the North might say that they liked the Northern one better. It sounded more familiar, but they really didn't have any particular attitudes about where the voices were from or what they meant. Um, in contrast, when we tested slightly older kids, so these are nine and 10-year-old kids in both locations in Illinois and in Tennessee, um, we found that kids thought that the northerner sounded smarter and the southerner sounded nicer. And so, you know, kids are gaining access to sociolinguistic stereotypes. What I think is particularly interesting about these results are that kids in both places are starting to endorse stereotypes that are both positive and about their own group and positive about the other group. So it's not that kids are just learning something positive about their own group, but they're really starting to learn stereotypes that cut both ways and they're doing so in both places. Um, one question I get a lot is where are kids getting these stereotypes? Um, I don't have the perfect answer to that. Although some research suggests that you can get a lot of information from the media and I'd be happy to return to discussing that. Um, so putting this all together, when you think about language-based social preferences, I will say it's often preferences for more familiar speech, but it's not always. Kids start to gain access to linguistic stereotypes and linguistic status in their society. Um, it's often preferences for more comprehensible speech, but again, not always. Kids could prefer native accented speech that isn't comprehensible, or in some multilingual settings, they might prefer a language that's seen as higher status, even if it's not the child's own language. And this impacts a wide range of inferences as people develop. Um, I think there's a developmental trajectory where we start out the world with a preference for native and familiar, and then there's a preference for high status get, that gets layered on top of that, and that's a really easy place for prejudices to be introduced. Now, why does this matter? I just told you a bunch about kids, um, and I think it matters for children, but also for adults too. Um, I think that language has huge consequences for adults' lives and decisions in a variety of contexts. Um, one is returning to this issue of trust. Um, you know, I gave you this example about how native accented speech can be seen as more credible, and it's not hard to think about all the places where this could matter when people engage with each other. Um, so now some people trust native accented speakers less than others, so there are differences across people. And there are differences that map onto people's level of prejudice, um, their level of ethnocentrism that predict whether or not they trust um, others. And there's huge implications for the law um, research, including some really fascinating research by our new colleague, Sharice King, who's an assistant professor in the linguistics department, studies how she studies how the legal system devalues the testimony of people who are seen as non-standard speakers, even if they're native speakers of English. Um, um, but that often, depending on the way people speak, they're treated with justice or without. There's also consequences for employment and housing. Um, there's audit studies where two people are sent in, say, to try to get a mortgage or try to rent an apartment, and they're really equivalent on every variable except for the variable of interest. And so you can send a bunch of pairs of people to try to get housing, and you might find that people who speak in a, a native, what's considered a standard way of speaking, are going to be more, um, more likely to secure housing. Um, there's some really interesting studies by 
Jeff Groger, who's here at the university, um, looking at differences in earnings um, between young adult workers. So he looks at differences in earnings of equivalently qualified black and white young workers and find that white, white workers earn more money, but that actually there's a lot of complexity and nuance to the data. And so he finds that the way, um, the way people are seen as speaking, even when they're um, absolutely qualified in every other, you know, statistically qualified in other ways is predictive of how much they speak, whether or not somebody identifies their voice as sounding white or black. Um, can predict their ultimate earnings. Um, and then there's a lot of evidence that employment law can be really complicated when it comes to how do you think about speech and accent and employment. So insofar as somebody, um, insofar as accent is a marker of national origin, it's protected in employment law, but it gets really complicated really quickly. So if somebody says, well, I'm just not hiring this person because they're not good at communicating and I need a really good communicator for my job and people can't understand them, it gets very complicated because a lot of communication is uh, bi-directional and a lot of it is about the listener and the prejudice that the listener brings to the table. And so in this sense, I think there's a lot of room for acknowledging uh, language and accent bias in employment law. I'll also note briefly essentialist thinking, our thinking about human groups and whether we think about other people as being really meaningfully the same or different from us um, can really depend on language. Some people talk about the idea that by learning a new language, you might learn this entirely new set of thoughts and feelings as if you've got this intuitive belief that language marks something fundamental about who you are. Um, now, if, and with this, it can become really easy to discriminate against people who speak in a different way with this kind of fundamental psychological belief that they must be a really different kind of person in some way. Now, of course, the flip side of thinking about this is there's also a positive direction about how much we care about people's language and their voices. Um, research by Nick Epley and colleagues is, shows how just hearing somebody's voice, hearing them talk can be humanizing. And so I think this facet of language is really important to understand. Now, I'm just going to end quickly with one more study. Um, now, a lot of what I've talked about today is about people evaluating others based on their speech or evaluating linguistic diversity in their environment. Um, but what about people who are raised in a situation of linguistic diversity, who are raised with people who speak in different languages or different dialects? Um, you know, what about them? So I'm just going to show you one little study, but there's there's a number of studies in this uh, in this general research program. Um, so this study that you're seeing now is um, a study that children participated in where you can see um, on the left the child's view where it's a four by four grid and they can see a small, a medium, and a large car. And on the right you can see the adult's view and some of the objects are occluded from view for the adult. So if the child is paying attention, they might note that, oh, well, you know, if the adult says something like, can you move my small car? If the child's just taking their literal communication, they might pick the smallest car. Um, versus if the child's thinking about what the adult can see see and know, and the adult only has visual access to the child's medium and large car, then the child might interpret that as saying, oh, okay, the adult said small car, but actually she must be referring to my medium car because that's the one she can see. Okay. So what we found when we tested a group of kids on this task was that a group of monolingual kids um, picked the medium car, thereby taking the adult's visual perspective and thinking about what that person could know and interpreting their communication about 50% of the time. So it might look like chance on this graph, but I really think that means they were actively perspective taking about half of the time. Now, children who were bilingual did so about 75% of the time. And what I think is most interesting is children who weren't bilingual themselves yet who were regularly exposed to a different language. So say had a nanny or a grandparent who regularly spoke to them in another language, um, those children uh, looked just like the bilingual kids and were more likely to take the adult's visual perspective. Now what I think is really, really uh, important to think about in these data are that when a child is raised hearing multiple languages, they're not just learning the languages. 
they're also gaining practice in linguistic perspective taking. So they're thinking about who speaks what to whom, who understands what content. Maybe I speak this way at home and this way at school, or maybe I notice that mom speaks this way with grandma, but actually, you know, we don't always speak this way in other contexts and so forth. So there's just a lot of social tracking that they're doing around language. And I think what happens is that that can pay off in terms of perspective taking more generally, which is a really important facet of interpersonal understanding and communication. So um, I think I'm just about out of time, but I want to end with why I also think this matters for thinking about education. Um, so in 2014, a bipartisan group of US senators and representatives wrote to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences requesting information on the relationship between language learning and the nation's strength, competitiveness, and well-being. And what they found was that, um, yes, we are falling behind. And as they quote in the report, there's so much to gain by participating in a multilingual world and so much to lose if we remain stubbornly monolingual, um, which I think is really important advice for us all to think about that, you know, not everybody has the possibility of raising a child in a bilingual environment, yet hopefully children go to schools and that's a place where we can support children coming in who speak a language other than English at home and who need a lot of support to learn English in school as well as children who just hear English at home and can be supported early in life in learning another language too when they are able to learn it. Um, and so uh, thank you so much uh, for joining us tonight and for um, engaging in this discussion. I'm so excited to hear your questions that you'll be sending. Um, and you know, a thanks to my, uh, my many collaborators and students who are you know, such great collaborators on so much of this work um, and to my funders. And you know, I just put a lot of most of this and other things too together into a book called How You Say It. So a special thanks to my family and my littlest supporters who put up with me while I was writing the book. Um, so thank you so much. And I think that uh, Nick is now going to join us um, on screen for some to hear your questions. Yes, I will. Thank you so much, Katie. That was wonderful. And let me also echo uh, Andrea's comment earlier about how happy we are to have you back in Chicago. You went off to Ithaca for a few years, enjoyed the changing leaves there. That's fine. As a Cornell PhD, I can forgive that, but we are delighted to have you back with us at the University of Chicago. So happy about that. Um, so we've got, a, we've got a ton of questions here coming in. If you do have questions, I'll do my best to bring them up. Please um, type them into the question and answer box and I'll get to them as, as best I can. So we've got a number of questions coming up about uh, the bilingualism effects that you discussed towards the end. So I'm, I'm wondering if we could start by talking about those, because that's fresh on everybody's mind. Sendol uh, Revoluri uh, said that, quoted that, that you said that depending on the way people speak, they're treated with justice or without. That's very powerful in his mind. Uh, two questions came out of that. One, is it possible to either influence these biases? Let's just start with that. Yes. Is it possible to influence the way we perceive mm -hmm. accents yeah. in others and the extent to which we use them as cues to another person's identity mm -hmm. or not? It's such a great question and it's so important. Um, I have two answers to that and I'll say, you know, we're not there yet, right? So I don't have the, the perfect answer that's going to, you know, fix the world and we're all going to stop being biased against language right now. I don't think that exists, um, but I'll say two things. One is that I think having conversations like this are really important. Um, I think that very few people are aware of language and accent as a place of prejudice and privilege and discrimination that it's often just not something that comes up that much. Um, you know, so just to give an anecdote, when I test kids and families in my lab, if a child is um, expresses a race-based preference, parents are typically really uncomfortable um, and upset with watching this, um, you know, as they should be. Like, I think it's a good thing that we're becoming, we're becoming aware of developing biases and doing what we can to try to change that. In contrast, if a child expressed an accent-based preference, 
often the feeling in the room is just completely different. It's as if the kid, you know, sometimes parents are just, you know, something like, well, my kid's pretty good at languages, right? It's almost like it doesn't even cross our minds as something to be concerned about. You know, a lot of social psychologists talk about a motivation to control prejudice, right? So when somebody acts in a certain way, are they, are they really unprejudiced or are they just trying to control their prejudice for others? When we think about linguistic discrimination and bias, in my view, we're not even in the place yet where we're trying to control it in front of others. And so I think this is an important conversation for people to be having. Um, the second thing for what we can do is I think when we think about conversations with people, we can all do our part to try to become better listeners. That's probably true in a lot of different domains, but I'll tell you what I mean in my little small sphere of things, which is that there's evidence that when somebody doesn't like someone's accent, it's really easy for them to shut down. And again, notions of comprehensibility and communication and whether someone's a good communicator or not, often they're very subjective. So people can have the experience of, oh, I heard this person talking, I didn't understand them. Um, you know, they weren't a good communicator when and that's sort of their subjective reaction. Whereas if they took a more objective measure of understanding, they understood them just fine. And so I think that that's another thing we can do is to try to be mindful when you feel like you're not understanding someone or you feel like they're not communicating well, to try to instead, you know, kind of lean into the conversation to ask follow up questions and engage. And that can help the listener, but it can also help the speaker feel more heard and less stigmatized. Mm -hmm. it, it's complicated, though, too, because people also do use their accents to strategically connect with others in some ways, I presume, right? Not necessarily consciously, but mm -hmm. like, you know, if, if you grew up in Tennessee and now are living in New York and you go back home and talk with your friends, you likely pick up that Southern accent again in order to connect mm -hmm. with that in-group. So there's that tension as well. I mean, as with most group biasing kinds mm -hmm. of phenomena, they're yeah. kind of two sides of this sword and it's, yeah. it's complicated. Right. It Language is. binds us to some and disconnects us from others. It's complicated. And connecting is wonderful, right? Like, of course you take on these linguistic properties of your hometown and that's a wonderful thing. And that's not something that people should try to stop themselves from doing. And in fact, they'd probably be pretty bad at it if they tried to stop themselves. Um, mm -hmm. That said, I think it is, as you're saying, kind of this double-edged sword. And I think that um, being aware of how we might be biased against others based on how they speak is an, how they speak is an important part of that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So um, there are a couple of different ways that people try to approach Sendel's question here about influencing our own biases. One is to change the, the mind of the judge, change the mind of the, the inference maker. The other is to change the context in which we make inferences about each other. And modern life allows us many opportunities to connect with others. We can do what we're doing now, where we can hear each other, but we can also type to each other. And do you have thoughts about um, what we ought to do? I mean, is, is it a, 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 a meaningful suggestion to say if we wanted to remove some of these intergroup biases from our judgments, we should have people typing to each other rather than talking to each other? Is that like your a, a research reason? which your research would suggest that then it would all fall apart so I'm probably yeah. not going to uh, I'm not going to suggest that and I don't think that you know language is about spoken language is about social life and communication like we should absolutely be speaking instead of typing so you know I don't think we should take language out of this I think what we should do and I like your idea about are we policing ourselves versus are we setting up structures that let our be you know let us be our best selves um, and I think there are structures that we can put in place and so so, you know, I think about education as one really important structure where we can set in motion um, the ability for children to learn languages. Now that can be learning English for many children. There's a lot of school districts that don't have the resources to support English language, uh, English language learning children. Um, and I think we can also make foreign language learning be a priority of uh, early elementary school when kids are able to learn language. I think in the US, we often have this idea that language learning is like a, an extra or a bonus or something you do after you did the regular kind of learning. Um, whereas I think it should be seen as primary. So I think those kinds of structures will 
change societal attitudes and not operating at the level of any one individual trying to check their biases at the door. The other thing we can do is think about employment structures. So uh, you could have employment law um, include accent as a category in its own right that is protected against. But even without that, given employers can set up structures where somebody is interviewing them and it requires communication skills to actually write down what are those communication skills? Like what would actually be required? Um, what can this person person communicate and what can't they communicate and they might find at that point that actually somebody who's really incredible for this job yet say who isn't a native speaker of English would be the perfect fit. Mm -hmm. So so Margaret Lewis asked would you suggest then to teach your kids to be bilingual bilingual if you had that ability and I, I want to tag on one other question to this um, which is a question about the data do you find that bilinguals also use, are less likely to rely on say accent or language yeah. as a social identity cue? Mm -hmm. Does it undo that or does yeah. it heighten that? Right, sensibility? Yeah, both seemed possible. And so well, let me answer the first part, which is yes. would I raise my kid bilingual if I had the choice? Absolutely, yes. Not everybody has the resources or the possibility to do so. I'll say that if you're listening and you're a parent who has a heritage language in your family and you're deciding whether or not to pass it on to your children, I think there's a lot of advantages of passing it on. And there's research to suggest that families can feel more connected when their family language is passed on. Um, and if you're say you live in a monolingual society and you speak English, I think if you can find opportunities to expose your children to multiple languages, I think that's ultimately a very good thing. Um, so that was the first part. Um, the, does, does teaching bilingualism yeah. lead people to mm -hmm. use language yeah. less as a cue to identity? Yeah. So or more? Yeah, it's so interesting because I could see it both ways, right? So on the one hand, you know, you should be more open-minded. Um, on the other hand, you've just lived in a world where language is probably marking social groups for you, you know, and so you're learning, um, you're learning that, you know, maybe with this family we do this, and with this family we do these customs or something like that. I'll say it's something I'm really fascinated by. I have some data that speaks to both sides of that, and so I'm not entirely sure how to put it all together yet I'll say it's not an obvious answer it's not like you're you're bilingual and all of a sudden your prejudices go away or you know that's that's not the answer that we do have some evidence in babies that babies start to see language as marking categories thinking that two people who speak in the same way are fundamentally alike in some other kind of way are likely to engage um, we don't find that with bilingual babies at least we don't find it quite as obviously or early in life and so there might be some flexibility in how the system is set up early on um, there's there's also some evidence that um, other researchers have found that older kids who are bilingual or who are learning another language might essentialize language slightly less. They might see it as less of a critical, defining, deep property of somebody and more likely to be something that, you know, think that this is something that I could learn or that's learned via my environment. And so, you know, I think there's some suggestions um, that being bilingual might allow kids to be more open-minded, but um, I don't feel that I have definitive data there one way or another. I wonder if, um, I wonder if you get any clues from this, this study you, you did with the white uh, and black children making inferences about sort of the stickiness yeah. of language versus race. I just, I'm always fascinated by that experiment. There are two really interesting aspects of that one. One is that the white children, when they're young, seem to think that language is stickier than race, which is just stunning. Um, and that goes away over time. What do you think kids in those households are learning yeah. as they get older? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, I think you're, I think like when I, when I think about this, you're right. I break this down. If I had a longer talk, I would say there's kind of two things to think about. Like what is, what are those little white kids doing and what's happening over development, right? So you're starting out thinking about language and then you're learning something. And then the next question you could go to is what is it about the social environment between white and black kids in the same neighborhoods and the same school in Chicago? Um, what is it about their experiences that's leading them to categorize people in different ways? Um, mm -hmm. But to go to that, that first part, you know, I think that um, kids are probably learning about language and about race, although I do think it's 
possible that what's really driving um, their thinking is more about they're starting to learn about race in a society that you know has structures of racism throughout and so I think that probably what kids are doing between say five and ten is they're living in the U.S. and they're learning about race. Now we tried to get at that question through sort of a different way which was testing bilingual white kids saying okay these kids have a lot of experience with language and with people who speak different language. Mm -hmm. So are they going to, are young white bilingual kids going to look more like the older white um, monolingual kids? And what was interesting was that even kids who spoke multiple languages themselves, these young white kids were still prioritizing race. Now we really hit them over the head with it. We tested a group of French English bilingual kids. So they were going to the, um, the Lycée Francais in Chicago. And so they were hearing English and French. They were actively learning both in school. And and those kids seemed to um, trend more towards uh, picking the race match than the language match. So I think with a lot of exposure, kids can think about language as learned, but I think their intuition, for, even if they're a bilingual, is to think about language as something perhaps that you've always had as opposed mm. to something that you've actively learned. Mm. That's totally fascinating. Um, so Victor Aoki has a, takes us in a slightly different direction. Again, appealing a bit to technology like we were talking about with text-based interaction a moment ago. And Victor wondered if you'd ever looked into how children or, or adults for that matter, perceive uh, artificial voices, computerized voices. Um, and have you, have you looked into that at all? It, that seems to be something that's particularly difficult for computer scientists to get right. Mm. The subtle cues mm -hmm. and language and, and accents. And I wonder if you could say more about those artificial voices. Yeah, so I haven't looked into that question um, per se or myself, um, but I will say, you know, there's evidence about how children, as I'm sure you know well, Nick, um, how children over perceive minds in a lot of things. And so I think this is probably no, you know, no exception that it's really easy to think about a thing as having either having a creator being meant to be having a mind inside it, something that's interacting with you. And so I think kids might kind of over perceive the, the mind behind technology sometimes, even when it's not, you know, actually there in that way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, we have time for one more question. Um, and I, I wanna go to a question that was sent into us before the, the presentation here from David Rosenberg, mm -hmm. who asked about, he said that he'd read many years ago that Japanese children could recognize the difference between the sounds of R and L until about six months of age, following which that distinction was canceled. This raised a number of questions in David's mind, including whether there's really free choice in selecting friends and so on, if your language sort of evolves over this way in ways that even affect your ability to perceive things. So um, what are your thoughts on, on that? Yeah, well, I mean, really deep questions about free choice are probably going to get above my pay grade and, you know, yeah. beyond this presentation today. Um, but, you know, I think that's a really interesting example and I'll just share um, some of the research behind that. So. There's research to suggest that babies start out universal listeners. So what that means is that right away, they do have this preference for language that sounds familiar, but different languages have different phonemic contrasts. And so the meaningful difference between say, where you place your where, how you make a T in your mouth. So it, whether you're putting your tongue at the top of your mouth or more closer to your teeth, say something like this, that in English isn't a meaningful difference. It would just sound like a T to us, but in other languages that would be a meaningful difference. Those would be two different sounds that would pick out two different meanings um, in words. And so babies start out universal listeners, so they can hear all of these different phonemic contrasts and distinctions. And then over the course of the year, the first year of life, they kind of get tuned up on what they hear on their native language. And they start to lose the ability to discriminate foreign differences in language, differences that aren't reflected in their native tongue. Mm -hmm. And so I think it shows this social narrowing and this social attention. And it makes a lot of sense from the perspective, again, of language is social. It's here for connecting with people. and so. 
you know, contrasts that aren't going to help you connect with anyone or aren't going to help you understand anything aren't useful. And so you don't need to, you know, spend your time learning those or remembering those. And so then as for the questions of choice, I think that, you know, there's absolutely something about how we are set up to categorize the world. Kids are trying to figure out who's like me and who's not. They're trying to figure out the social and societal structure around them and what's seen as valuable and what isn't. But I think that what we put in into those buckets as adults, you know, what we see as valuable, whether or not we express prejudice against different groups. I think a lot of that is open for kids to be learned based on the input that they receive. Mm -hmm. All right, so I think we are at time. So I'm gonna turn it back over to Andrea here in just a second. I do just wanna end by, um, by noting that, that psychologists, at least from my perspective, are at their best when they take a phenomena that's operating under all of our noses. We experience it every day. We're living in it all the time and put a microscope on it that allows us to see things that are right in front of us that we otherwise couldn't see. And I think Katie's work is uh, one of the best examples of psychology at its best, is taking language, which we use all the time, we're listening to constantly, and shows us all sorts of sophisticated, complicated, interesting, occasionally shocking effects that are happening under our nose uh, that we didn't even know was, was there. And the potential of this, uh, the reason why this is all worth knowing is it helps all of us be a little wiser in how we deal with these everyday aspects of life um, that are so easy to, to overlook and not think so carefully about. So Katie, thank you so much for sharing your work with us here tonight. It's wonderful. Highly recommend your book if uh, folks watching uh, haven't read it uh, or picked it up, please do so. And thanks for asking me to uh, to be here with you tonight. Andrea, back to you. Thank you so much, Nick. I appreciate it. It was so interesting to talk with you tonight. Thank you, Professor Eckley. That is very well said. And, and I agree. I, um, Katie, we write another book and I, I want to read everything that you put out. <laughs> Thank you both so much for being here and for sharing your knowledge and, and insight. And thank you all so much for tuning in for today's Harper Lecture. So thank you again. Uh, enjoy your evening and we'll see you soon.